welcome to GLJ Specials. My name is Nora Markart and I'm an editor for the German Law Journal. My guests today are Ida Marman, senior researcher at the University of Haifa, and Catherine Costello, professor for fundamental rights at the Hattie School in Berlin, and professor for migration law at the University of Oxford. We will be talking about their special issue entitled Border Justice, Migration and Accountability for Human Rights Violations. What was your motivation to edit a special issue on migration? Um, thanks, Nora. So um, I guess I worked on the human rights of migrants and refugees for a long time. And you mentioned my monograph. And I guess what I had argued there was that um, status migration control assumptions lead to a lot of weakness in terms of both the way substantively the human rights of migrants are understood. So the state's migration control prerogatives are given a lot of sway. Um, so there's treatment that's, I think, often legal, but still looks like a, a pretty serious infringement, if not violation of human rights. Um, and also just that there's Aside from that sort of normative issue, this, there's a massive practical issue of massive human rights um, violations within migration control that are either sort of obscured um, or not even recognized or are sort of quite spectacular and visible, but it's very hard to trace accountability in a legal sense for them. So there was that sort of doctrinal problem and a practical problem. Um, and I suppose I had a curiosity about it too, because I'd written about these issues very much with a European focus and looking at EU law and the ECHR, but I was increasingly seeing that um, the same sorts of problems were being framed in terms of international criminal law or tort law or different bodies of law were being mobilized, if you like, to try to address these problems. And I thought there was, um, it was timely to look at these questions in sort of a broader frame and I was really keen to explore those different sort of legal avenues as well as just looking at these questions as straightforward questions of human rights law. Yeah, um, I joined uh, second. This was actually a project initiated in, uh, by Catherine and then uh, she kindly offered me to join as a co-editor. This uh, really appealed to me. I found it attractive because it seemed to propose an opportunity to think about uh, legal and doctrinal questions, as well as theoretical questions about accountability, alongside um, questions that come from the context of human rights uh, struggles and specifically struggles that take the form of litigation. What were challenges and problems you faced in the process of research and writing? Um, in terms of disagreements, I don't think that um, Catherine and I had so many disagreements along the way, but I do think that we had um, dilemmas. And uh, those dilemmas specifically um, were also not only dilemmas between us, but also with the, with the several, with the different authors and their approaches. So we have, uh, we have um, consciously uh, devised a group of authors that come with quite different methodological toolkits. Some are more doctrinal, some work um, more theoretically or more close to a law and society approach. And in many cases, we wanted to bring the pieces into greater conversation and involve um, you know, insights from one piece in another or see how they, how they come together. And um, specifically, I think that we found that as we try to state briefly in the introduction, we have, I think, under, two underlying differing views about um, the relationship between human rights litigation and legal scholarship. And here I identify specifically, I th you know, I think specifically representing these, this are the pieces with, by Thomas Gamble, Dr. Hansen, and Nick Tan. On the one hand, the piece that Catherine already described, which has takes a kind of pragmatist approach, an all things considered approach in terms of choosing a forum and trying to assert accountability and how to expand jurisdiction and how to respond to political and forces surrounding uh, the set of events that one wants to address through a, with, by a, a, appealing to a court. And on the other hand, we have a piece uh, like um, Violetta moreno Lox's piece, very impressive, um, interpret reinterpretation of the notion of jurisdiction under Article 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights that takes an approach um, that 
uh, moves somewhat away from the notion of control as it has developed in the jurisprudence to um, a different notion of the kind of effective government authority um, and you know that has a kind of governmental authority over a particular situation which needs to therefore also have human rights jurisdiction and that's not a pragmatist approach that is a very principled uh, foundationalist approach if you will and i think that's the most kind of pointed uh, continuum uh, of differing opinions where i think readers might also want to try to situate themselves and understand where they uh, fit in, where their approach fits in and which orientation do they feel is more useful at one point we had a a note that we had given to workshop participants because there had been a call and that there was a quite a long process and and one question that i had asked everyone to address and i think no one did myself included <laughs> was what are, what is the relationship between political and legal accountability um, and in the end most of the pieces are about legal accountability i mean lillian looks at the ombuds the european ombudsman um, but but for the most part they're about legal accountability, sometimes through things like positive duties and due diligence obligations, which obviously are mainly operationalized in the political context, but they're mainly looking at accountability, I think, in a legal sense. But nobody, and given that there is a backlash literature out there, which would suggest sometimes legal accountability can be counterproductive. Um, yeah, I was, it, it wasn't so much a disappointment, but I think that work is definitely still to be done. What are the most important findings and the limits of your outcome? So interestingly, I think the main uh, finding or thread that came through many of the piece, pieces was the importance of positive duties in human rights law, which is something that I didn't specifically expect, but that I think that since we published uh, the special issue and in the last uh, weeks and months has a really um, kind of um, suggested very, very interesting new um, fora for accountability and, and legal actions um, that really in, in some way are foreshadowed um, in the special issue in my view. And specifically, I'm thinking of my colleague Valentina Azarova, who uh, is with the Global Legal Action Network and has drafted a very, in my view, impressive um, complaint uh, concerning uh, EU funding, uh, Libya and the kind of due diligence obligations and duties that attach to uh, development funding when uh, there's an entirely foreseeable and in fact well-documented record of that funding reaching detention facilities that impose inhuman integrating treatment as well as systematic um, violations of the right to leave and a kind of idea that human rights need to be enforced ex ante or you know it's not only our job as lawyers to come after the violation and look back and say we now need to hold uh, whatever authority or person accountable but also we need to think how to prevent uh, these violations and i think carla firstman daria deviti and valentina uh, and, and and vladislava sotoyanova's uh, pieces all um you know, kind of articulate that view in a very um, in, impressive and um, comprehensive way. In terms of your other question about um, the limits or where one hits mm -hmm. a brick wall, I think my own piece, in a way, uh, tries to um, gesture towards that question. I focus on um, civil disobedience and about uh, on the role of um, rescue activists in particular in the Mediterranean. And I try to suggest that any enforcement is preconditioned on the very presence of people surrounding the event, whether that is through, you know, physically or through surveillance mechanisms, but there cannot be enforcement without this kind of civic engagement with the problem that really uh, is, is at, the, at the basis for what we're talking about, which is oftentimes in spaces of debatable jurisdiction and uh, beyond uh, territorial borders. So that's, I think, the, how I think of that second interesting question about the, the limits. I think of the limits as signaled and kind of expanded, but not by legal action, 
Um, rather, I think of it as outlined by the activists that try to, you know, get there and see what's happening and be involved. Well, I, I think I, I think Edmar summarized the sort of, if you if you call it a finding, but I guess a common theme, which we mm -hmm. all around positive duties. And I, I think what was really interesting about those three pieces, as he said, is we didn't ask people to think about positive duties. It just really came through very strongly in those mm -hmm. three pieces. Um, and partly, I think the focus is because there's a lot of action by private actors, um, mm -hmm. but not only. Um, I mean, that's particularly in the case of, of Daria Davidi's contribution. Um, I had always been a little bit skeptical about business and human rights and due diligence standards. But of course, then for some people, they read those as an articulation of broader principles in international law. So just where the line between a positive human rights duty is and a due diligence obligation um, and the relationship between those two conceptual frameworks, I think they work out in slightly different ways in their contributions. What next? What are the current challenges? And where is further research required? What we're seeing now in the mid-Mediterranean is a violation of the very core, the very basics of international human rights law when it, as it applies to migrants and refugees. Um, in simple terms, we're seeing in the Greek context a more or less systematic violation of the rule of non law. Um, these returns are being, carry being carried out um, you know, oftentimes using inhuman degrading uh, means or torture. And this seems like a place where uh, judicial intervention is, you know, invite, is really needed even in a, the most conservative interpretation of the rules without having to expand or try to innovate. And there, there is, I think, this kind of need to pull back and, and, and look, look at the basics because the basics are very much under pressure. Um, asylum, whether asylum is lost or not, to use Daniel uh, Gesselbash's terms, mm -hmm. is still to be determined. But in terms of what is happening right now, that is, that is my kind of most immediate um, reaction. I'm always struck that there's a, a small important literature on strategic litigation in relation to migration and asylum, which is, which is cited. Obviously, there's um, Moritz Baumgartel's book is, is mentioned in passing, some work by Steve Melly, which looks mainly at Latin America and a few other pieces. But compared to other areas of human rights, you know, we don't have a very solid empirical literature. And this would be literature mainly by, so, by social scientists with empirical mm -hmm. skills. It could be lawyers, but I guess in the European context, they're less likely to be. But there isn't really the equivalent of, say, Lisa Van Halle's work on disability rights or, you know, Catherine Sicking's amazing body of work on human rights, where you really get an account of what works and when. Um, so I think that that's a kind of part of a future scholarly agenda, which always looks at courts, not in isolation, but litigation as part of broader strategies. I think that's the, the hallmark of most of that sort of literature. Um, I think as Sitamar said, you know, the practices in Europe, I mean, it's hard to say are things getting better or worse, but certainly, you know, they're egregious, pervasive um, human rights violations, you know, which, you know, on any, by any measure are breaches of non refumo and also just, um, I shouldn't say just, but, you know, straightforwardly um, inhuman and degrading treatment of detainees. And obviously in the pandemic context, a lot of reception centers de facto become places of detention because people have been effectively locked into them, which changes their legal character and obviously their, their, their the practical experience of living in them vastly. Um, and, but I think the question of border violence in, in just a very, not in a sense of structural violence, but just physical border violence done at European borders and EU borders in particular, I mean, that to me seems to be crying out for some sort of EU level inquiry or response. And, and I think that's pertinent then for another reason, which is of course, you can't assume anymore that the rule of law and liberal democracy are secure within the EU. Um, so we need that toolkit from people who are used to fighting authoritarianism now within the EU. So that's, you know, and that challenge isn't really discussed at all in the special issue, but obviously mm -hmm. it's something the German Law Journal has covered a lot. But, you know, if you're somebody, um, at the sharp end of border violence in Hungary, then 
you know, there are obviously people who do amazing litigation based in Hungary, but um, yeah, the Hungarian courts are themselves not always the reliable forum and the European Court of Human Rights is itself under immense strain. So you can't assume that, you know, that these traditional routes to accountability are, the, are going to be the effective ones. Thank you.